morning and welcome everyone. My name is William Levwood. I'm the minister here at Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church. As we begin our service, if you're in person, I invite you to silence your phones, take a deep breath, and center yourself for worship. We open and welcome to the ancestral people of this land, acknowledging that our church, like all of Burke, rests on the unceded territory of the Manahoac tribe of the Great Sioux Nation. We seek healing and the realization of justice with the people of this land, who live on in their descendants, the present day members of the Monacan Indian Nation, the Patawomac Indian Tribe of Virginia, and the Piscataway Indian Nation. We honor the ancestors as we move toward healing so that all together shall one day know full justice. Welcome to Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm Christina Watts, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm happy to be your worship associate today. I hope you got a name tag, or have put your name on your Zoom name tag. If you need help with that, please let us know in the chat. If you aren't new to Akatink, look around. Do you see people that you haven't met or haven't spoken with in a while? These people like you and want to meet you. Help us live up to our mission to be a welcoming and inclusive spiritual home for all by reaching out and making a connection. By visiting this congregation, newcomers are in a transition moment and people in transitions are more open to new friendships. Whether you're a longtime member or a newcomer or something in between, we encourage you to stay for our social hour online and in person immediately after the service. We're so delighted that you decided to join us today. Welcome. I invite you to rise in body and spirit and join us in our chalice lighting words. This morning they're going to come from our new proposed UU values. You'll see two slides uh, and just follow along as you see each slide. Love is at the center of Unitarian Universalism. Love is the practice of our living tradition. As Unitarian Universalists, we covenant to help everyone flourish with dignity, honor the web of life, be beloved community, cultivate generosity, celebrate diversity, transform the world with love. So we're beginning the month of October, which means we have a new Soul Matters theme. Our theme for this month is heritage. So currently, our Article 2 names how UUism, Unitarian Universalism, draws from six sources. But acknowledging that this list of six sources is not comprehensive, that we draw from an even wider expanse for our inspiration. The new proposed Article 2 names that we draw inspiration from secular, sacred, and scientific sources. In today's service, we'll look at how our Unitarian Universalist heritage has been a widening of the circle in both where we find inspiration and in how we're called to act for justice in the world. Next Sunday, we'll look beyond our UU heritage exploring how to heal our ancestral heritage, both familial and societal. And then the third Sunday of the month, we'll get really big with our Blessing of Animals service, where we'll explore our evolutionary heritage, another widening of our circle of inspiration and of care. And then the fourth Sunday, we'll learn about the founding of this congregation, and how it's been a community of refuge, of care, and of guidance for those who found and continue to show up and find it and join us on the journey today. Good morning. morning. So today we are going to talk about embracing and affirming theological diversity. I think we're in the right place for that, right? Correct? Yeah. Personally, that was what drew me to Unitarian Universalism. 
I have seen in my experiences a lot of division and strife when it came to theology. And what positive outcome can we have when we can't move beyond differences? We each experience life differently. We process relationships and the world around us differently. Differences can be good as long as love is at the center. So I have a question for you all. Does anyone here have something in their life that renews their spirit and makes meaning of the world around you? I have my garden. Very nice. My family. Uh, being a grandmother. Yeah. Creative writing. Plug for the UU Soul Matters creative writing group that, that Kate is going to be co-facilitating. My imaginary friend. My wife. My granddaughter. She has a beautiful spirit. So we have a wide range of things that are meaningful to each of us individually. And I can relate with that. I have you know, the people in my life that are very meaningful, but also when I take walks by myself in the woods with the trees, somehow that's healing to me. But these things make sense of, of the world around us, and they're meaningful. So I'd like to share a story entitled The Circles Around Us. This is a story about how to expand our worlds with kindness and, and inclusivity, even if it seems scary or uncomfortable. The Circles Around Us by Brad Montag, illustrated by Brad and Christy Montag. We begin by drawing a circle on the ground along each shoe, a safe little place for just one person Nobody in this circle but you. You could keep that circle closed to everyone but yourself, but that would be like a library with just one book on the shelf. So let's draw a bigger circle for you and your family to share. Now you see what all can happen in a circle full of care. It becomes a happier circle as more loved ones come to stay. And wouldn't it be even better if all your friends would come and play? So you stretch and draw your circle even bigger than it's been and let a few more people know they're welcome to come in. In the circles all around us, everywhere that we all go, there's a difference we can make and a love we can all show. Yet, there are still so many outside the circle who are different in all they do. Though it feels slightly uncomfortable, we draw a, big, a bigger circle for them, too. It doesn't mean the circle is easy. It can get harder the more we share. But wonderful things can happen when love is known and felt everywhere. As time passes, our eyes open. We see others we really care for. And that's when we ask ourselves, well, what's this circle really there for? So let us create bigger circles all around us for the rest of our days. Let our caring ripple out in a million little ways. And the circles all around us, everywhere that we all go, there's a difference we can make and a love we can all show. As our circles grow and grow and we watch them wonder-eyed, remember the first circle started with just the love you hold inside. So I wanted to end this with the thought that UUism started as a small circle, a community with love at the center of our faith. And from love at the center, we expand our circles. And I'd like to quote from the proposed Article 2, because it's just that good. 
As Unitarian Universalists, we proclaim that direct experiences of transcending mystery and wonder are a primary source of inspiration. These experiences open our hearts, renew our spirits, and transform our lives. We draw upon the sacred, the secular, and scientific understandings that help us make meaning and live into our values. We respect the histories, contexts, and cultures in which they, these understandings, were created and are currently practiced. These sources ground us and sustain us in ordinary, difficult, and joyous times. Aware of the religious ancestries we inherit and grateful for the experiences that move us and the diversity which enriches our faith, we are called to ever deepen and expand our wisdom. With that, all of you, we are all called to widen our circles. Thank you. Our reading this morning, which Christina are going to do back and I are going to do back and forth, is adapted from our Soul Matter Starting Points curriculum, from a, a piece called Unitarian Universalism in Eight Minutes, but we're going to do it in I think three. <laughs> Unitarianism began as heresy. Unitarians rejected the Trinity, finding no support for it in the Bible. Instead of being Trinitarian, we were labeled Unitarian. God is one, not three. This led to an intellectual problem and question. If God and Jesus are distinct, then how is Jesus special? The Unitarian answer is that Jesus is a moral example of how to live a good life. Universalism began as heresy. The rejection of a predestination, the belief that some people will be damned to an eternal hell. Instead, universalists emphasized the compassionate, loving image of God and embraced universal salvation, the belief that God's goodness won't let anyone go to hell. Over time, Unitarians begin to notice and honor numerous other religious leaders who lived like Jesus, who modeled a similar way of being in the world. Over time, Universalists extend universal salvation beyond Christianity to include members of all religions and non-traditional religious movements like humanists and atheists. As Unitarians embrace religious exemplars from other religious traditions, leaders who, like Jesus, were models for how to live an ethical life, Unitarians widened the circle to embrace and affirm theological diversity. As Universalists embrace multiple sources of inspiration from many religious and non-religious traditions, Universalists widened the circle to embrace and affirm theological diversity. So you can see how even though Unitarianism and Universalism started with different presuppositions, they ended up in a similar place. This embrace of theological Diversity is a defining feature of our UU heritage. And while it isn't entirely unique among religious traditions, I'm not sure any other tradition takes it quite as far as we do. Certainly not among others who, like us, come out of the Abrahamic traditions. Because of this unique way of approaching religion, it can be difficult to explain Unitarian Universalism to others who aren't familiar with it. For most Westerners, religion means shared theological belief rooted in a singular source, like the Torah, the Bible, or the Quran. If we embrace and affirm theological diversity, then what brings us together, people often ask. And is Unitarian Universalism really a religion or a thing at all if we can believe whatever we want? Let's answer that second question first. You use can't believe anything. While we embrace theological diversity, that embrace of theological diversity is grounded in our shared values. If we look at the current six sources, every one includes a clause defining how that source informs our values. 
We don't say that we embrace all Jewish and Christian teachings. Our sources state that we draw from Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. We draw from humanist teaching, utilizing reason and science to guide and inform us and to defend against idolatries of the spirit and of the mind. I've always felt that that last part is especially important because placing it in the embrace of humanism, it calls us both to use reason and science to avoid idolatry while also letting us not forget that reason and science can be idolatries of the mind as well. I'm sure we can all think of many historical abuses of science and reason which have been used to justify racism and sexism and gross injustices like inhumane medical experiments carried out without consent, including forced sterilizations, both of which have happened in the past and are still happening today. We don't just draw from the world's religions, we draw from world religions when they inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. And the new proposed revision of Article 2 changes the name of this section from sources to inspirations. And as I stated earlier, it widens the circle even wider, naming that we draw from sacred, secular, and scientific understandings that help us make meaning and live into our values. It states that these sources ground and sustain us in our daily living in ordinary, difficult, and joyous times by opening our hearts, renewing our spirits, and transforming our lives. It calls us to be more careful about how we respect the histories, contexts, and cultures from which these sources arise. And finally, with gratitude for this enriching diversity of sources, we are called to continue to widen the circle, to continue to deepen and expand our wisdom Ours is a living tradition. We draw from it, and we also give back to it. From you, heritage, I receive. To you, heritage, I give. Together, the generations share, and from this, we live. I've called this sermon Unitarian Universalism on One Foot. That's a shorthand for Unitarian Universalism in brief. And we need that. We need a way to share our living tradition with others. We talk sometimes about having an elevator, an elevator speech about Unitarian Universalism, how we can share what our living tradition is if we only have the time it takes to share an elevator with someone else. Naming that we draw from sacred, secular, and scientific sources that help us make meaning, that sustain us in our daily lives by opening our hearts, renewing our spirits, transforming our lives. I think that makes for the beginnings of a good elevator speech, especially if you have a story at the ready of how Unitarian Universalism's openness to multiple sources has inspired you in your life. For example, I might share how Unitarian Universalism has enabled me to find spiritual sustenance in Judaism, Buddhism, and Sufism, and how it includes the wisdom of science fiction and poetry, and the insights and meaning I receive from making art for myself through dance. I might just share also a single story of what makes this important in my life in this moment. How I remembered how Judaism's morning rituals and daily prayers and communal study helped me get through probably the most challenging time in my life after a death in my family. And how just this, or how just this week a poem about forgiveness is helping me to love myself better. Sharing how these sources and our openness to multiple sources enrich our life is one way of sharing Unitarian Universalism on one foot. But the one foot is only one foot. 
follow, stay with me here, our theological diversity and drawing from multiple sources is one defining feature of our living tradition, but there is another foot. So I'm gonna tell you another story of Unitarian Universalism on one foot while standing on the other foot, so to speak. The UU seminary I attended was part of a consortium of theological schools, and we were able to take classes at the other theological schools. So I took multiple classes at the Institute of Buddhist Studies, a couple of courses at the Baptist Seminary of the West, a course at the Dominican Seminary, and a course at the Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. It was at that Lutheran seminary where a student asked me one morning what Unitarian Universalism was. And I thought, as many of us do when we get this question, oh my goodness, here we go. So instead of answering right away, I said, you know what? I don't know much about Lutheranism. How would you explain to me what Lutheranism is? What's it about? She said, salvation by grace. And I thought, oh, if that's how we're talking about things, Unitarian Universalism is about salvation by character. Now, I don't know if that was a very satisfying dialogue for either of us. If I remember correctly, neither of us elaborated. So we didn't hear from each other how our faith traditions did all the things our UU sources and inspirations tell us a faith tradition can do. How we're sustained in ordinary and difficult times, how our hearts are opened, our spirits renewed, our lives transformed. And for myself, over the years, I've realized that my answer wasn't completely accurate. I've realized that I could have also said that Unitarian Universalism is about salvation by grace. Though just saying that in itself wouldn't be a complete telling of our living tradition. So let me elaborate a little bit. Unitarianism has historically been focused on salvation by character. Universalism proposed a radical version of salvation by grace, universal salvation. Salvation by grace for everyone, no exceptions. But even that isn't the whole story because just like with our earlier synopsis on the other foot of Unitarianism and Universalism, those foundational convictions have grown and evolved over time. So with Christina's help, I'm gonna to try to share that growth and evolution with you. Unitarianism. Unitarians believe that God created human beings with the capacity to be good and that the world could be like a garden. In that garden, what was needed was to create the right conditions for the flourishing of the human spirit. For early Unitarians, this meant each individual was responsible for refining their character, for living into our God-given potential through study and spiritual practice. Universalism. Universalists believed that God's love would leave no one out of the circle. For early Universalists, this was a healing message that countered the fear of a vengeful God condemning some people to an eternity of torture. Some Universalists believed each person's soul would have to be reconciled to God through a purgatory, while others believed heavenly salvation was automatically granted to every person upon death. Over time, Unitarians began to notice that everyone has the opportunity, not everyone, has the opportunity to refine their character by engaging in study and spiritual practice. That unjust social systems make it so that some have the wealth and privilege to be able to refine their character, while oppression makes this much less available to others. Over time, the Universalists begin to notice that many people were already suffering in hell right here on Earth. Unjust social systems make it so that some people live in a heavenly garden of privilege and wealth, while others are ground down by oppression and exploitation. As Unitarians saw the injustice in the world, Unitarians began to work to liberate themselves and others from oppressive systems. Unitarians turned their focus from individual salvation by character towards making the world a communal garden 
where every person has the right to flourish with dignity. As universalists see the injustice in the world, they begin to work to liberate themselves and others from the hell on earth. Universalists turn their focus from sharing the good news of a heavenly afterlife for all people to making the world a communal garden where every person has the right to flourish with dignity. So there you have it, Unitarian Universalism on two feet, with apologies for the ableist metaphor. Said another way, these are two defining features of our UU heritage. Drawing from multiple sources to live into our values, sources that help us to make meaning, to open our hearts, to renew our spirits, and living our values collectively to make a world where every person has a right to flourish with dignity. If you're using this as a template for an elevator speech about Unitarian Universalism, that second foot, I might suggest sharing a personal story about how your Unitarian Universalist faith has called you to work collectively to make the world a garden where every person can flourish. It could be how you've joined with others to counter racism, advocate for women's rights, show up for LGBTQ, BTQ plus rights, work for immigration justice, mentor youth, work for common sense gun laws, register people to vote, write letters to legislators, show up at voice actions, give regularly to our outreach collections. These are all things that we do here in this congregation. You could share any number of ways that you work collectively with others to make the world a place where every person can flourish with dignity. Now many of you may remember me telling the story of the Roman soldier who asked Hillel to tell the whole Torah while standing on one foot. I really like that story. I think I've preached on it twice already, so this makes three times. The Roman soldier who asked Hillel to tell the whole story of the Torah while standing on one foot, and you might remember that I think we often ignore an important part of the story. That after Hillel gives a succinct answer telling the Roman soldier that the whole of the Torah is not doing to another that which is hateful to you, he says, the rest is commentary. Now go and study. Our UU heritage isn't perfect, and we're not perfect today. As a tradition, we've made many mistakes along the way. Unitarians and Universalists have sometimes been on the right side of history and sometimes on the wrong side of history. That history is our commentary, and it's crucial that we study that history of where we've been right, where we've been wrong, and how collectively we've worked to right those wrongs. Studying that history is how collectively we learn to live into our values as Unitarian Universalists, how we might see that we're making some of the same mistakes today. Perhaps we're so amazed and nourished by that universal salvation, that idea that everyone is loved, that we don't take the next step of working to make heaven on earth. Perhaps we're so focused on refining our own individual character that we don't notice the ways that we're supporting unjust systems. Even though we're able to walk through the day, move through the day without raising our voice, right? Treating people nicely throughout the day, we don't notice the ways that we're supporting those unjust structures. So studying that history can help us to do the work. And sharing the two feet of Unitarian Universalism with others. How we draw from multiple sources to make the world a garden where every person can flourish with dignity. That's also an important part of the job so that we can pull others into our faith. I don't think I regularly share that that Roman soldier goes on to convert in the story to Judaism, to study the commentary. We need people to join us, either as Unitarian Universalists or as fellow journeyers on the path, so that we can study the commentary and then get our hands dirty, planting seeds, 
and tending the earth. May it be so, and may we be among those who make it so. As we extinguish our chalice, I invite you, you can uh, join hands if it's comfortable for you or just raise them. As we extinguish our chalice, I invite you to join me now in our community blessing with these words of David Bumbaugh. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences and beneath all our diversity, there is unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time, death, and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity.